Welcome to the CISO seminar on the national minimum wage. Um, I'm Luke Hammer, co-director together with Joseph Chunara. Um, now, I'm going to introduce the speakers briefly. Um, probably it occurred to me thinking about this um, that uh, in a way it's become very, very quickly, very even more topical than than uh, we we thought uh, when uh, David actually first mooted this seminar. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, cost of living is a, a sound contender for the word of the year. Um, and obviously that that will uh, pose challenges for for the whole uh, minimum wage uh, uh, procedure as well, I, I would assume. Uh, I'd certainly look forward to uh, hearing more about that from from our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll go in the sequence, I think, that uh, uh, they will speak. So we have um, first uh, starting with David Coates, who's a visiting professor here at, at uh, CSWEF. Um, amongst many other things, he's director of uh, Work Matters Consulting. He's uh, been head of economic and social affairs at the TUC and uh, Fairly on in the beginning of the Low Pay Commission, I uh, was also a member uh, of the uh, Low Pay Commission. Um, Tim Butcher uh, will go second. Um, he's a labour economist, uh, I think by, by trade. Um, worked in different arms of the government. I think probably quite relevant for this as well. So I don't know whether we'll have a an international dimension to it, but I thought it was quite interesting that uh, you helped the German and Irish governments to set up their uh, low pay commissions or minimum wage uh, uh, commissions. And uh, Tim's currently chief economist and deputy secretary at the uh, low pay commission. And uh, Kate from her corporate headquarters today, uh, will speak uh, as, a, as a third uh, speaker. Kate Bell has, uh, I think, a substantial background in local government and also knows the inner workings of the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, at the moment uh, is head of rights, international, social and economics department at the TUC. And I assume that means you're inevitably extremely busy. Um, so. So much for for the introductions, I should probably say that uh, the the seminar will be recorded. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, so they will be uploaded um, The speakers. Uh, are fine with that. For any other contributions, just treat it accordingly. Um, uh, turn off your video if you don't want it recorded. Um, and uh, I just should say that we're really grateful um, our speakers could carve out time uh, for that seminar, and I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion. So David will kick us off with probably some context on the uh, national minimum wage. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a presentation, but I'm not quite sure how to share it. I'm not, where is enable screen, screen sharing on this wonderful? Any advice on that? There's a share button at the top right. Of oh, the the I've open share tray. Sorry, you could. A share button. Nope. No, I've got nothing that says share. Nick, do you want me to upload it to the files and then? If if you can if you can run the presentation because you've got it, Joseph. Because I can't see how I can do this. Uh, let's have a look. No, I've got nothing that says share. Okay. Nick, can you forward 
the presentation to me and I'll I'll do the business. Yeah, I mean, where where should the share button be, Joseph? Is it along the the next to the mic mic and camera? It's it's next to mic and camera. Yeah, on the control bar. Uh, it's a little arrow pointing up. Yeah. Hey. Oh, OK. Fantastic. Have you got that? Yeah, you can see yes. that. Yes, yeah. Oh, great. OK, very good. I'm not so incompetent. Right. So let's start the slideshow then. Uh, play from start. Uh, there we go. OK, so national minimum wage uh, retrospect and prospect. Uh, can I just say thanks to Tim and Kate for uh, joining us today? I know they're both extremely busy. Uh, Kate's even busier than I was when I was doing a comparable job to hers because she has employment law and God knows what else international chucked into her portfolio too. Anyway, um, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about the history of not just the national minimum wage, but minimum wages in the UK. Uh, reflect for a moment on where we are at the moment um, and then talk about how the policy might be developed in the future. I'm hoping I won't um, steal too many people's thunder. Um, uh, if I do, Tim, Kate, just tell me that I'm stealing your thunder and I'll move on. Uh, now, um, the idea of a national minimum has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, you find it in Beatrice Webb's uh, minority report on the poor law from 1909. But she wasn't simply talking about a floor under wages. She was talking about establishing a level of income, which uh, to slightly misquote Adam Smith, not just kept people above subsistence, but enabled them to appear in public without shame to be full participants in society. Uh, we're still probably not quite there. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is an idea with a very long and honourable pedigree. In terms of public policy, you first find the establishment of wage laws uh, in the late 19th century in 1891, uh, when the um, Conservative government adopted the first fair wages resolution, which, is, which essentially required all contractors providing goods and services to government to observe the general level or the accepted level uh, of pay uh, in that industry in that locality. And the fair wages resolution was updated in the 1920s and uh, sorry, in the 1910s and 20s, and again in 1947, uh, so that essentially the collectively bargained rate in any industry or sector became the rate that any government contractor had to pay if they wanted access to the um, public sector market. Um, and according to Otto Karl Freund, this had a bigger impact on the observance of collective agreements than any other measure. So the idea was to establish a wage floor using collective bargaining as the base across all public procurement. And then in 1909, uh, we see the establishment of wages boards that became wages councils under the 4551 Labour government, which adopted a slightly different approach but assumed that in certain sectors, in sweated trades, as they were called, uh, that there needed to be a model of wage fixing, bringing together employers and unions and independents to break any uh, uh, um, uh, deadlock between the parties, to then fix legally enforceable minimum wages and conditions in those sweated trades. The assumption at that time was that at some point collective bargaining would take over because as the parties developed their relationship, became more confident in dealing with each other, as trade unions organised in these sectors, it would be possible to move from statutory wage fixing to a purely voluntary approach. And that principle, the idea that you start with something statutory and then move to normal conventional collective bargaining, persisted right the way up until 1975, when the Employment Protection Act um, enabled wages councils to be translated into statutory joint industrial councils uh, without any of the independent members, but retaining the legal enforceability of those uh, uh, JIC orders. Uh, that was abolished in 1980 by the Thatcher government and has never come back. 
Another example of the idea that collective bargaining was the best way of establishing minimum conditions was the unilateral arbitration, unilateral arbitration arrangements that were introduced during the Second World War and again continued up to 1980. And unions were then empowered to bring complaints before the Central Arbitration Committee that an employer was not observing either the recognised level or the general level specified in collective agreements and the COC could make an award of paying conditions. So throughout all of this, the assumption was that collective bargaining was the best route to establishing minimum pay and conditions in an industry. Trade unions and collective bargaining were the best way of protecting workers' interests. Now, that all began to change a bit in the late 1960s, uh, when public sector unions in particular believed that the voluntary system condemned their members to persistent low pay because government incomes policies were essentially a policy of wage restraint for the public sector. Tim might have some sympathy with this as a public sector employee. Uh, and uh, it meant that um, public sector workers were essentially on the receiving end for bad news from government incomes policy. And this led uh, the National Union of Public Employees and in particular, its General Secretary, Alan Fisher, and his head of research, Bernard Dix, to intensify the argument that there had to be a statutory national minimum um, as an alternative to all of these voluntary arrangements and the assumption that collective bargaining was always best. Now, uh, I brought a visual aid. Here is a piece of uh, what you might call industrial relations archaeology. Hope you can see that. That's Dix and Fisher's book, Low Pay and How to End It, from... 1974. And this really set the argument in motion, I would say, from the 1970s right the way through to the TUC and the Labour Party adopting the minimum wage uh, as a formal policy in the late 1980s. But uh, what's interesting too are the differences between what we currently have and Dix and Fisher's proposals. Because what Dix and Fisher were arguing for was something more like the universal basic income. But rather than the universal basic income being provided by uh, wages and top ups from the state or a basic income for everybody received from the state, they were suggesting that all employers ought to provide something like a UBI uh, paid directly from the wages bill. They were also making this argument in the context of what they saw as um, a socialist programme. Uh, calling for greater economic planning, um, although the paradox is that they weren't really willing to um, address directly the desire of other unions with higher paid members from continuing to bargain without state intervention. And the way they envisaged the national minimum wage being fixed, uh, which is more like the system we have today, was through an annual national negotiation between government trade unions and employers, uh, which presumably would then ensure that nobody uh, had to run the risk of appearing in public without shame. Uh, what's interesting too is that at this point in 1974, uh, Fisher and Dix were not arguing for a formula to determine the national minimum wage. They simply said um, that it should be part of a national negotiation involving the social partners. Uh, by the middle 1980s, on the other hand, New P have fundamentally shifted their position, as indeed had some other unions, to argue for a national minimum wage fixed at half male median earnings. Uh, I won't dwell too much on the precise calculation um, or the components of that formula, but that was the policy on which Labour fought the 1992 election. And I think Kate is going to say a little bit more about that. Now, of course, Labour lost in 1992 and the Low Pay Commission proposal appeared in uh, 1995, 96. And essentially, it was a political fudge when it emerged from Labour's policymaking machinery. It was a political fudge. It was a way of getting the Labour Party off what it saw as the hook of the half male median formula. And at the time, uh, and I was at the TUC working on minimum wage policy with my uh, colleague Bill Callahan, who's my head of department at the time, uh, we saw it as a fudge and we weren't quite certain what to make of it uh, and how we should respond to it. But uh, Ian McCartney, who is the shadow minister of state for employment, 
uh, set up a, a group, an implementation group, uh, of which I was a member, uh, which then spent the best part of two years um, coming up with a practical program for the implementation of the national minimum wage, including the constitution of the Low Pay Commission. And that's pretty much what happened, although the Low Pay Commission uh, was rather smaller than um, McCartney had envisaged. Uh, he was thinking about 15 members and we ended up with nine, three, three and three. Uh, and I have to say that judgment for a smaller commission was probably right because it led to better relationships between the parties. And it also made it easier for me as a TUC official and as a commissioner to manage <laughs> my colleagues and to reach some kind of consensus with the employer representatives. And largely as a consequence, I think, of the excellent um, chairmanship or chairship of Sir George Bain, who was the first chair of the commission, um, it has become an established institution, simply part of the furniture of labour market regulation. Nobody is suggesting the commission should be uh, abolished. Um, and the working methods, as I understand it, endure from uh, George Bain's time. So an interrogation of the data, collection of evidence from stakeholders with formal evidence sessions in London, and uh, also importantly, going out and meeting the data, as Professor Willie Brown used to say, talking to low paid workers, talking to the employers of low paid workers, talking to unions on the ground at local level as well. Uh, and if you think about it, the Low Pay Commission is the only new successful labour market institution established by the uh, 1997 to 2010 Labour government. Uh, it has been a success. But uh, I have to say that my own view is that the integrity and independence of the Commission has been somewhat compromised uh, in recent times, initially by George Osborne and then by subsequent chancellors, who have sought to specify a particular um, amount of money that the low pay commission ought to be aiming for as the national minimum wage say two three five years down the track and the national minimum wage has become almost the only instrument uh, that the government is willing to use to combat low pay i know tim and kate are going to say more about that so i'll move on now if that sounds like a, a, a record of success to some extent it is but if you look at the percentage of workers who are low paid in the UK, um, it's still well above the OECD average and other countries do significantly better, including France, and Finland, Denmark, New Zealand. I'm not quite sure I believe the Turkish numbers down at the bottom end of that chart, but this is directly from OECD stat and there is no better source, I'm afraid. So uh, believe it or not, if you like. But certainly the uh, data from um, uh, from uh, major European economies is right, and the UK's position here is broad, broadly right. It's improved slightly in the last year as the national minimum wage has risen, but nonetheless, the UK still has a very significant low pay problem, which the national minimum wage has not cracked. I think we also need to think creatively, too, about how we define low pay and what we mean by low pay. Because, as I think Tim may mention, uh, the impact of the higher rate for the over 24s, the national living wage, has been, yes, to pull more people out of low pay, but it's also led to a bunching just above the level of the national minimum wage. Now, um, this tells us something about using purely statistical measures to determine whether somebody's life chances have or have not been transformed. And I think it's fair to say that people earning, you know, 20, 30, 50p, or even a pound an hour above the national minimum wage are still going to be struggling, particularly in the context of the cost of living crisis. And the view that the national minimum wage alone can do more than simply be a plimsoll line under labour, I think is to um, adopt a false prospectus. More needs to be done. The minimum wage in itself is no more than a wage floor, and it cannot solve the problem of in-work poverty. More than that, uh, we know from the work of people like Nick Hammer, who's chairing this session, that low paid workers have a much wider range of problems with the quality of their employment. Uh, employment insecurity, casualization to some extent, an absence of voice, um, 
uh, authoritarian management behavior, uh, uncertainty around hours, um, poor health and safety practice. There's plenty of evidence of that in the clothing industry in Leicester. All of these things aren't touched by the national minimum wage. So if we want to look at, in general terms, the quality of work as experienced by those people in the bottom quartile, we need to think about more ambitious interventions. And to start with, I would say that the Low Pay Commission ought to do more than it currently does. It ought to do what it says on the tin. Um, with all due respect to Tim, this is no criticism of what the LPC does. You're working within a statutory remit. Um, at the moment, it's really just a minimum wage commission reviewing the impact of previous recommendations on employment uh, and on earnings and um, making some assessment of what may happen at uh, increased levels of the minimum wage in the future. It isn't looking at causes, consequences and cures, if you like, uh, and I think that's what the Low Pay Commission should do. There's certainly a case for trying to clarify the law on employment status to deal with some of those wider problems that I talked about, um, and I'll say no more about that because time is short. And I think there's also a case for recognising that if you want to improve the quality of work in low paid sectors, you need to get a bit more social dialogue going on in those industries. And one possibility would be for the Low Pay Commission to come up with some principles of affordability to determine what a minimum wage should be, for those to be shared with what I would describe as something between um, an old fashioned wages council and an LPC at sectoral level, which would have a balanced membership, three employers, three trade union reps, three independents, including the chair, to fix not just pay, but also some basic conditions around hours of work, contractual status uh, and holiday entitlement. And I think that would be um, an attempt to learn from history and also to establish uh, a more effective set of interventions that challenge employer prerogatives and give unions, their members, workers, a stake in the process that they currently don't have. And finally, I would say that the government ought to be a responsible client. Um, it ought to be only uh, procuring goods and services from the reputable. And I think there is a very strong case for reintroducing a fair wages resolution that fills in the gaps that were still left there in the 1947 resolution. I'll stop there and uh, let Tim take over. I hope that was interesting and sorry about the screen sharing problem. Thank you, David. Have I stopped screen sharing? Yes. yes. Excellent. I suggest we have a discussion at the end. Um, uh, so I'll just hand over directly to Tim. OK, can you see the slides OK? Yeah, so this is uh, uh, just an overview of the sort of um, the process, the impact and um, the, the uh, prospects going going forwards. Um, so the, the national minimum wage framework um, has changed since it was introduced. Um, so initially it was uh, the national minimum wage. Um, the recommendations were more of a judgment um, with the, the aim within the commission to help as many low paid workers as possible without damaging their employment prospects. And that aim or objective continues to be the case um, today for the youth rates. That's for all the rates that are below the national living wage. So currently the 21 to 22 year old rate, the 18 to 20 year old rate, the 16 to 17 year old rate and the apprentice rate. Now the national living uh, wage was given a target by George Osborne in July 2015, um, where he raised the minimum wage by 50 pence for those aged 25 and over. Um, and that was introduced on April the 1st, 20, 2016. And in phase one, uh, the sort of the Osborne target, uh, you could call it, was to reach 60% uh, of median earnings for those aged 25 and over by 2020. Um, we think we've done that, although um, we, we, with the pandemic, um, we, we're not uh, entirely sure we're exactly where we are uh, 
within the wage distribution as the, the data has been severely distorted uh, through the, the furlough uh, scheme. Um, um, but we hope that ASH 2022 that we will get uh, later this year will uh, will be a fair reflection of what's going on in the labour market and we'll be able to uh, assess where we are on that path. Um, phase two to reach two thirds of median earnings for those aged 21 and over by 2020. Um, that was a policy first announced by by Hammond when he was uh, chancellor, uh, then taken over by Javid, but wasn't actually implemented until uh, Sunak uh, took over as chancellor in um, February or March uh, 2020. Um, yeah, so so that's the the, the framework. The the process. Um, so it's quite difficult difficult to see, but uh, we we receive a, a remit um, usually in sort of January January to March. It's usually at the time of the uh, spring uh, statement or the, or what was the budget. Um, we then uh, go through through the year gathering gathering evidence. We have uh, stakeholder uh, engagement with written written evidence. Um, we've currently got a call out for written evidence on the impact of the minimum wage and stakeholders views on what it should be going going forward. That that um, closes in, in mid June. Uh, we then invite the some of the more interesting um, uh, uh, providers of that evidence to oral evidence sessions where they are uh, cross examined by the Commission um, to, to uh, suss out whether the the evidence they've provided is 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 evidence or, or just a sort of point of view. Um, so in order to to understand better what's going on in uh, in, in those sectors and uh, amongst the work, those worker groups, we then uh, move towards um, making our, our recommendations uh, alongside those. We carry out visits um, around the country, as David's mentioned before, and we still do. And and um, today, we are currently on a visit to Walsall uh, and we will be moving to Wolverhampton later this evening. Um, I don't think any of them have got tickets for the Wolves Man City match though. Um, but we're, we're visiting um, some uh, social care and uh, uh, other uh, 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 retail as, as well um, on, on that visit. Um, and then we also have uh, commissioned research and a research programme and in-house analysis to help inform uh, commissioners in their deliberations, which takes place in mid-October, uh, where they make decisions on uh, the future of the minimum wage, make recommendations for the rates uh, the following the following year. Um, sorry, indeed. <laughs> There's a trouble with having uh, sense, um, sensitive lighting that, that, that if you don't move, um, the lights go off. Um, and then we, uh, the commissioners having met in mid-October, then uh, make recommendations that we give to the government by the end of October and we produce a report and then that feeds in and it feeds into the remit and and the process continues again and should be noted that we make recommendations but it's up to the government whether they accept or reject those recommendations. The uh, stick that we have for that is that if the government rejects our recommendations they have to lay down the reasons for doing so in Parliament. Um, so the government's remit to us this year um, so is to monitor and evaluate the national living wage and make recommendations uh, for the path to two thirds of median earnings by 2024. Um, there is a subject to uh, sort of a caveat. There is an availability of an emergency break um, taking economic conditions into account if we wish to, to use it. The other minimum wage rates, as I said before, are set on. Um, we have to monitor and evaluate those and make recommendations based on uh, increasing the rates without damaging employment prospects. We've also been asked to pay particular regard to um, those workers with protected characteristics who are more likely to be low paid and also as part of the levelling up agenda, looking at the different impacts acro across the UK. And this year we are uh, conducting a sort of review of the accommodation offset of the national minimum wage. That's the amount that employers can deduct from wages if they provide their employees with accommodation. Uh, so the impact of the minimum wage so uh, so far, so you can see that the uh, 
the minimum wage prior to 2016 had increased the bite, that is its value relative to median earnings over the period from when it was introduced in 1999 um, and it was continuing to do so. However, the uh, increase in um, the or, or the move to the national living wage was involved a sort of step jump in the, in the bite and moved at a slightly faster sort of trajectory towards that 60%. Um, as well as uh, increasing the, its value relative to median earnings. We also see that the wage growth at the bottom of the pay distribution was much stronger than further up the pay distribution. And that coverage increased, uh, coverage increased, uh, doubled between 2015 and 2016. But one of the uh, surprising things that we've we've seen um, in the period since 2017 is that coverage has remained pretty static since then. So we had an increase from around uh, a million to 1.6 million in, in as a result of the, the national living wage increase in 2016. But the coverage or those directly paid within five pence of the minimum wage has stayed roughly at that level of 1.6 million uh, since uh, that, that time. Um, we had expected it to increase towards 3 million, but that hasn't been the, the case. Um, and we can see that coverage has increased across the UK um, with the darker lines show, the darker areas show the uh, a higher coverage um, than the lighter areas. And we can see that the UK has got darker and it's been spread uh, across the, the UK uh, rather than just in a, a few pockets. Um, however, despite those large increases in, in the uh, minimum wage and, and, and towards the bottom of the earnings distribution, um, it doesn't appear to have harmed uh, employment, uh, at least not up to the first quarter of 2020. Um, a lot of our analysis sort of, sort of come on to mention uh, some of the challenges in a second, but it's, it's, it's basically we're confident with the data up to around February 2020, but then something happened across the globe that meant that uh, our analyses of um, the impacts of the minimum wage have been difficult to discern from the impact of the uh, pandemic um, since uh, February, March 2020. Particularly as a lot of the uh, sectors most affected by the pandemic were also minimum wage sectors such as retail and hospitality. Um, but the, uh, as well as the Descriptive analysis, we see that econometric studies have also suggested limited impact of the NLW on jobs uh, with limited employment effects, limited spillover effects um, and limited effects on hours. So firms have generally used other ways to absorb the increases and we think they've done that through a combination of increasing prices where they can and pass through of that, uh, taking a squeeze on profits, changing pay structures where they've been able to, um, and we've also seen very limited uh, impact on productivity uh, with the only sort of thing that's um, sort of, uh, the main th measure of driving that has been increased intensification of work rather than uh, better automation or firms becoming more efficient in a, in a sort of positive uh, manner. Um, and despite those large increases in that first phase of the NLW from 2016 to 2020, the ranking in the UK has changed uh, little in exchange rate terms um, from where we were on the left hand side, which is where uh, on the, the bottom bar is where we were in 2016. And that's where we projected we would be by 2017. And this is the latest data that suggests that we, we haven't uh, increased, uh, mainly because other, other countries have also increased their minimum wages uh, quite substantially too. <clears throat> In terms of um, the challenges we faced, um, we had to integrate uh, last year. We had to integrate three new commissioners. The rates retreat was the first time, so that was held in October last year. That was the first time the commissioners had met uh, as a group for over 18 months. Um, the evidence gathering was also affected by the pandemic. We had no face-to-face -face stakeholder meetings. We went on no visits uh, of. Uh, we've been on no visits since March, and indeed the visit to Warsaw and Wolverhampton is our first physical visit um, since since uh, since March 2020. Um, the outlook for the economy was and is still very uncertain. 
the quality of the evidence and ability to gather it uh, has been affected by by the pandemic. Um, and that's particularly affected our main data sources, uh, which is the annual survey of hours and earnings and the labour force survey. Um, the, the annual survey of hours and earnings has been affected because um, in April 2020, around a third of private sector workers were on furlough, meaning they got paid 80% of their wages, their wages, but were actually doing no hours whatsoever. So in derived hourly terms, that, that's um, uh, it's difficult to it was difficult to calculate an hourly rate for for the for those people. Um, similarly, with with the, the labour force survey, over ONS has developed some other surveys that have been quite useful, um, particularly the the the, the BICs uh, on how businesses uh, were coping, and also they've um, released much more data on from the real time information, the HMRC uh, tax collected uh, database. Um, other challenges we face with the range of wage forecasts were much wider than, than usual uh, due to the uncertainty going forwards. We had um, a similar challenge to last year in terms of um, setting out the, the benchmark path. Um, and part of that was because deciding where we were actually in the on the earnings distribution because of those uh, effects mainly caused by furlough we still don't really have a good handle of what the median wage in the UK was in either 2020 or 2021. We think we've got a slightly better handle in 2021 because the uh, furlough affected only about 10% of the workforce then, um, but uh, compared to 30% uh, the previous, previous year. So in terms of how we plot the path, so how we determine this uh, path towards two thirds, we project the median, we take the median from the latest ash, um, which uh, we, we've used two methods, one basing it back in 2019 when we think the data is reasonably robust and also using 2021, um, uh, for which is the latest data available. We then grow that median uh, in line with average weekly earnings growth. Um, we use average weekly earnings growth to proxy medium wage growth, and that's been a reasonably reliable um, in in measure to use in previous years, um, maybe a bit less so du during the pandemic. Um, and then we use um, the median of uh, wage forecasts from the Treasury, Bank of England, OBR, uh, and uh, project uh, out to October 2024. Um, and then from that, that median, so two thirds uh, median, we will work out where the bite is currently, and then we have equal yearly part, uh, yearly chunks in bite terms to the 67% and 66.6%, so the two thirds. Um, we, we've also, um, a slight tweak to this is that by 2024, the, the national living wage uh, is expected to cover those aged 21, so we need to make a decision on when to lower the wage rate to 21. Either we will make that recommendation this autumn or the following autumn. It's to be implemented in April 23 or April 24. Um, just a, a quick reminder: these were the uh, these were the forecasts available at the time we made our decision in October. So these were the forecasts in October, so so, let, so about six months ago. Um, we were expecting uh, inflation of 2.5% this year, or the Bank of England was. Um, I think they might be a little out. Um, and the uh, median of the HM Treasury uh, forecast panel were also expecting, well, expecting even lower inflation of 2.3%. Um, given that inflation now is expected to be towards double figures, um, that's uh, considerably way out. And sort of in some ways, <laughs> so in such a short time, our, our recommendations went from looking at, at uh, we, we made a recommendation of 6.6%, uh, looking at that it might be a little, uh, little high to looking like it might be a little low. Um, so. So in our uh, two, 2021 report, um, we 
we produced, we projected an NRW path using our, 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 our method that we've sort of tried and tested method. Um, however, we thought that because uh, wage growth was distorted by furlough and composition, compositional effects, um, we thought that the headline AWE uh, earnings data was a little high um, because of these uh, compositional effects and um, there were comparisons on a year ago when uh, the, the economy was um, sort of uh, uh, suffering from uh, lockdown and um, pandemic effects. Um, and also the wage forecasts we also thought were a little high, big, partly because they were influenced by those sort of effects. Um, so we we made a judgment that we thought that the outturn in earnings was going to be a little lower than those forecasts and um, gave a, a, a recommendation that was more in tune with the the final path being £10.60 rather than what the model predicted of £10.70. Um, so we made recommendations of 6.6% for the main national living wage. Um, the 4.1% for the for the uh, younger youth rates and the accommodation offset were in line with inflation and uh, uh, average wage uh, growth, so they were expected to maintain their uh, maintain their relative level compared to average wages, but be a little higher than than inflation. Although, as we we now know, that inflation has much higher, so those are real wage cuts for for those young people. For 21 to 22 year olds, recognising that we would be moving those that age group to the national living wage at some point in either 2023 or 2024, rather than having a large step jump in April 23 or April 24, we decided to sort of try and smooth that that increase um, and made a, a sort of nearly 10% uh, recommendation. And the apprentice rate, it was a long-standing commitment for the uh, low pay commission to uh, align the, 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 the rates with the 16 to 17 world rate. So what, what's happened since, as we know, um, We've seen high, high uh, wage growth. We've seen inflation uh, go up towards 8% and beyond. And our latest model forecast with bearing those, um, those uh, that increase in wage growth and inflation is now suggesting instead of £10.70 that we thought at the retreat, we, we now get a central uh, estimate of £10.95 um, and that that path doesn't include the latest Bank of England forecasts or the Treasury forecasts that will be published next week. Where we're expecting, well, the, if they're in line with the Bank of England wage forecasts, the Bank of England revised its wage wage forecast for this year up by two percentage points, for next year by one three quarter percentage points, and for the for the year after that by half a percentage point, uh, which would take our projected path well beyond eleven pounds if that was reflected in the other um, uh, in, in the other forecast. However, the thing I should caveat is that um, personally I think those wage growth estimates are possibly on the high side. And um, when we when we see the ash 2022, um, we might come back towards the the 1060, 1070 that we were expecting uh, last autumn. However, we do not know and we will not find out until towards the end of September, just in time for our recommendations in, in, in October. So in conclusion, um, so despite the challenges, again, the Low Pay Commission again agreed unanimous recommendations, um, as it has done in every uh, year uh, since it's reported in uh, 1998 since it was established. Um, the NLW is a big step change and a significant one has led to large increases in relative level of the minimum wage um, and the number of workers paid those rates. Um, the evidence so far is that it hasn't uh, detrimentally affected employment and jobs. Um, however, we don't really have a good handle of the impact so far in 2020 and 2021 because of the impacts of the pandemic and potentially Brexit have overshadowed any impact from, from the minimum wage. 
Um, and, and we think that lots of those things won't become clear until uh, later this year or early next year. So may may not even become clear before we make our decisions again for 2023. Um, and then going forwards, we obviously have the pandemic uh, effects continuing, uh, uh, changing our relationship with the EU. Um, and that's all been compounded by the event, events in, in Ukraine. And but on top of that, we have uncertainty of the measures of wage growth, uh, lots of discussion about what the underlying lying wage growth is with the Bank of England uh, seemingly thinking it's around 5% or more. The Resolution Foundation is closer to 3 to 4%. Um, and and ONS, I think, is, is also uh, to, towards the, the 4% rather than the 5%. So there's lots of uncertainty about what that underlying wage growth. We've seen a pickup in pay settlements from around 2 2.5% to around 3%, but nothing like the 4 or 5% that the Bank of England um, were concerned about earlier in the year, although that might um, it might become clearer as the, the April pay deals uh, are implemented and we see what sort of levels they are. Um, and just to uh, conclude that the ASH 22 should help us have a better understanding because it was conducted um, at the end of April this year when we think that uh, lots of the distortions from the pandemic, et cetera, should have uh, at least be weaker than they had been in the two previous years. Okay, so I'll hand over to Kate. Thanks, Tim. I'll just <clears throat> try and share my screen and maybe start talking while I do that. Um, are people seeing? Um, let me make yes. a slide yes. show. Yes, that's fine. Uh, let me change the view. Um, just a couple of kind of reflections on what people have said before, um, before I really kick off. Um, I guess um, one thing just to say is one of the reasons for the success of the Low Pay Commission is um, because of the excellent staff um, of whom Tim is one. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, you know, it's able to operate with kind of consensus um, and to make what I think are a good set of recommendations is because we have absolutely fantastic research and we're really well served by the Secretariat. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say is um, Tim described the kind of way we get to our um, negotiate, get to our numbers in a very rational way, which is, of course, what we do. But it is based on the best policy evidence. But it is also a process of bargaining, basically. And I think that's actually really, really important. Um, the tripartite nature of the low pay commission is pretty unique in the UK. Um, but it also enables us to respond to what ever since I've been on it in 2017, have felt like a kind of series of crises, I guess. So when I first came on, it was all about Brexit. Then, of course, we had the pandemic. Now we've got kind of particularly high inflation. And so I'm less sceptical than David, perhaps, about kind of the role of the target, partly because I do want to see minimum wages go higher. And I think, um, you know, it's important that government sets that as an ambition. But also because I think, you know, the role of the Commission has not been undermined because, um, you know, there's just been so much for us to do, basically. Um, so um, I think my slides have gone weird at this point. Um, so I will just try and flick them back. Um, uh, OK, so hopefully, are you still seeing the title slide just to check? No, I can't, can't see anything. OK, let me just try and share again who knows what happened there. Um, Be this one. Yeah, that's it. Better? Okay. Um, so, um, this, um, I took these from some old slides basically, um, not old, about two weeks ago from the last presentation I did in my template. And I had this at the start of those slides, and I thought I'd put it at the start of these slides too. Um, this is a really important issue we're talking about. There's also massive issues affecting trade unionists in Ukraine. And if anyone wants to support the trade unionists who are supporting um, people in Ukraine and fleeing the situation, you can do so there. Um, this was from my previous presentation, basically. So I was. Um, talking at um, an event held by the Nuffield Foundation and the Resolution Foundation on 
what to do next in labour market policy. And I'd kind of pulled out the national minimum wage of an example of, look, we really can do things. Um, and the reason I pulled out this quote is because um, the national minimum wage is now seen as a kind of accepted part of UK policymaking. But a little bit, as David was describing, um, it was massively controversial, basically. Um, so when, you know, the Labour Party introduced a commitment to a national minimum wage, um, the Conservative Party business was saying um, this is going to destroy jobs. And I think one of the things that I'm quite conscious of is um, every time we have a debate about the level of the national minimum wage, we're told it's about to destroy jobs. Um, so far, that hasn't been the case. That doesn't mean there isn't a level at which the national minimum wage couldn't be set, where it would destroy jobs. It's not to deny that kind of fairly basic bit of economics. But I do think kind of calls for caution have been a consistent part of what's gone on for the na with the national minimum wage ever since its inception. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind as we think about the future. Um, I think David talked a little bit about this, but I kind of wanted to reiterate the point that pay is hugely important to low paid workers, but it's not the only thing that matters. Um, these are just some quotes from USDOR members survey in 2021. USDOR is the trade union which represents shop workers and many distribution workers, um, many of whom are low paid. Um, they're all, not all about pay, these quotes, but they are often related to pay. Um, so people only getting statutory sick pay. We know some people don't get sick pay at all. Um, if they earn less than £120 a week, the lower your pay is, the more likely you are to do that. Um, there's obviously issues around um, the insecure nature of work, the amount of work you get, as well as the rate it is paid. But again, these are issues which tend to affect those on low paid work. And then, of course, you've got this issue around the cost of living, which is absolutely front and centre of everyone's um, minds at the moment and you know this person putting it extremely clearly even when my pay goes up I'm still worse off so I think the context really matters but I do think um, one of the reasons why trade unions have always centred pay in their kind of negotiating and campaigning it's not only because it's kind of the fundamentals but it's also often a sign of how much the business values those workers um, so there are definitely other issues but pay is generally pretty critical. Um, this is a slide that Tim's just shown you, basically, and shows where under the tr current trajectory, um, the national living wage is going to get to in 2024 if we hit the government's target of two thirds of median earnings. Um, the TUC for some time has had £10 an hour. Nat, we started off with £10 an hour as soon as possible. We're now on £10 an hour now. And as part of our campaigning around an emergency budget. Um, we've certainly been um, suggesting that one thing the government could do is think about how to increase wages a bit more quickly than the low pay cycle. But I think we're really conscious as a trade union movement that our £10 demand is pretty out of date. So we've started to do the thinking about what that might look like. And I'm not going to, in this presentation, give you a number we end up with, but just share some of some of the thinking we've been doing. I think one of the things that it's really important to remember is the national living wage and the national minimum wage has been rising quite quickly. And it's been rising relatively quickly as a proportion of median earnings. But overall, pay across the economy has been absolutely terrible. So you will definitely, if you've ever heard any TUC speaker in the last maybe five years, see us saying um, we're in the worst pay squeeze since the Napoleonic Wars. Um, that is um, the... Um, yellow line you're looking at basically which is showing how long it has taken years the number of years since real wages started falling how long it's going to take us to get back there basically um and um basically what it's basically saying is pay has been terrible for the last decade and you know there were some signs that after the pandemic people were thinking oh maybe we'll get normal pay growth again even before the pandemic people were saying maybe we'll get normal pay growth again after the financial crisis as Tim's just been explaining real wages are certainly not going up right now that's more because of the very high level of inflation rather than the level of nominal pay but it means basically we're in a real wage environment which has basically been terrible for a really really long time. And I think one of the things that it's really important to think about is what's that done to the level of the minimum wage as well as to wages for everybody else. So these are two different charts. Basically, the time scale is what's different on them, basically, which is looking at what would have happened to average wages if we just had wage growth at the level we used to have between 
um, pre-2010, so the exact rate we've used is 97 to 2009, when wages were growing at around kind of three and a half, three point to four percent, three point eight percent is the figure we've used here. So basically, on the left, you can basically see those blue bars, you know, average wages ticking along very gradually. Then you get this flat mississum, uh, nominal wages, very slow growth. And those pink bars are showing just how much higher um, average wages would be if they'd followed the 2000, the 1997 to 2009 average, basically showing that now our median wages, rather than about 1485, which is they are now, will be around 17 pounds now. The next chart is showing you, well, what happens in the years to come if we could get decent wage growth yet, uh, wage growth back. And that shows you that our median wages would be growing slightly higher. So we'd be getting to around a £20 average wage by about 2030 um, uh, under that trajectory. And the reason we're kind of thinking about median wages in the context of the minimum wage is because the target that the government has set and the target most people think about for um, assessing low pay is tied to the level of median wages. So in that framework, which I think we think is a reasonably sensible one, it's about tackling inequality as well as putting a floor under wages, higher median wage growth means higher growth of the minimum wage as well. Another point to make around that, I think, is that if we were tackled labour market inequalities, we would also be seeing much, much higher um, minimum wages. So we've just said that, OK, we could get to around a £20 median wage if we was if, you know, we accepted that we've had lost wage growth for the last decade. Um, and then we said, OK, that's happened. Now we're going to get wage growth back on track to what it was before 2010, which is not a particularly ambitious ask, it has to be said, um, you know, particularly when the OBR and the Bank of England are saying wage growth is actually going to be 5.5 percent, although, as Tim says, we're a little bit sceptical about that. We're saying, well, then you'd get to um, a median wage of about £20 an hour by 2030. However, right now, if you're a man in London, you're already getting the £20 an hour median wage. So again, median wages are not just affected by um, the pace of wage growth for everybody, but also if we closed some of those gaps, and this would be a levelling up measure, um, we'd have much me higher median wages at the moment. And that, again, would be setting the context in which we think it would be possible to achieve um, a higher minimum wage. I think it is really important to say that um, the minimum wage has been one of the most effective tools we've seen for um, tackling pay inequality. Um, we've seen women's pay at the bottom catching up basically because of higher minimum wages and you know some of the progress, exceptionally slow progress it has to be said, that has been made in um, closing the gender pay gap has been because of those higher minimum wages with women concentrated in historically low paid occupations for reasons we're all probably pretty familiar with and the general undervaluing of women's work. We also think, Tim can correct me from if I'm wrong, from the research that the Low Pay Commission has done, that the minimum wage does have a disproportionate impact on black workers, um, again, facing structural labour market inequalities, more likely to be concentrated in low paid jobs. And so again, minimum wages are a vital tool for tackling those inequalities. Um, and another reason for kind of thinking about how we can be ambitious about raising the wage floor. I've lost my forward button. Um, I think Tim showed you the bite, the way the bite of the median wage has been increasing over time. So the bite, for those who don't always speak this language, is the proportion of average wages that um, the minimum wage reaches. So the previous slides were kind of showing you, well, if we just get average wage growth going up, and even if we had the same bite, we'd have larger numbers for our national minimum wage. This chart is basically saying we think the bike could go higher too. Um, it's gone up by about 10 percentage points, I think by over 10 percentage points since the minimum wage um, was introduced um, by about 15 percentage points, actually. Sorry. We think it's perfectly plausible to say it could go a bit higher. Um, I think, you know, Tim showed us the evidence that minimum wages have not yet had um, a significant impact on employment or nobody's really been able to find it in the UK as yet. Um, that's my reading of the evidence anyway, and Tim and David can come back and dispute it. Um, we think there's scope for them to go significantly higher. And it was actually a colleague on the Low Pay Commission who made this point, which I thought was a really interesting one, um, 
at our last meeting, one of the things we've often worried about in the low pay commission is differentials and employers saying, well, you know, if the minimum wage keeps going up, um, you know, we've got to give all the supervisors an extra 50p and then that adds to our wage bill. Um, colleague made the point that if the cash values are larger, um, you actually have more kind of cash points in between 66% of the median wage. 66p, if you double, say you had 66p in a pound, if you double both those figures, the number of penny points between those figures becomes larger, basically. So larger median wages um, give you, again, more scope for actually increasing your differentials rather than necessarily seeing them as flattened when you think about it in cash terms rather than percentage terms. So again, I think we think there's scope for the bite of the minimum wage to increase too. And Tim's just showing you this chart as well. But, you know, as Tim says, um, minimum wages have been going up, but we're still not quite at the top of that chart. And there are several countries which have more generous minimum wages. This is shown in um, purchasing power, purchasing power parity, which is not a phrase I can ever pronounce coherently. Um, again, you can see, you know, countries with different bites, different proportions of the median, but we're not at the top of any of the charts uh, quite yet. And I guess we're just saying we think there's more scope for ambition. I think just thinking through um, what might be some kind of principles for minimum wage setting. Um, and I think I talked about this a little bit. Um, I think David talked about this um, in the kind of history of the minimum wage, but the social partnership approach in the UK has really played a key role in charting the path to higher minimum wages. I think if government had just mandated um, a target right from the beginning of the minimum wage, or even now without allowing the low pay commission to set that path and to negotiate that path, um, the policy would not have had the success and basically the kind of wide consensus it has. And I think if you look back to those kind of comments from the CBI um, and the Conservative Party at the beginning of the minimum wage, um, to now you've got a Conservative Party trumpeting its commitment to higher minimum wages, um, you've got business kind of broadly supportive and, you know, broadly supportive of the targets that government have set, um, although not at all times and in all situations, it's probably fair to say. I think that social partnership approach and the fact that business and unions and independent experts have had a voice um, in charting the exact path the minimum wage takes has been really important. Um, I've said quite a lot about um, how the evidence supports more ambition, but I think it is really important, and I don't think we've done this enough in kind of the way we've talked about minimum wages, that we see higher minimum wages being achieved on the back of higher wage growth for everybody. Our ambition, we think, should be for higher median wages for a larger kind of labour share, basically, for workers, um, as well as, you know, stronger economic growth, which is something the UK has been very much lacking in the last decade. Um, but one of the best ways to get higher minimum wage is to get higher wage growth for everybody. Um, I think it is really important that we see them as a complement, not a substitute to other forms of wage setting. Um, David talked a little bit about um, the idea of kind of tripartite sectoral institutions. Um, the TUC and now kind of the Labour Party have sort of moved our position onto straight sectoral collective bargaining, basically. So the idea that unions and employers negotiate across a whole sector in order to set a minimum rate of paying conditions for that sector. And the Labour Party is now committed to bring in fair pay agreements. They've said they'd start in social care. Really interestingly, um, you might have seen Sarah O'Connor's article in the F Tea this week, which talked about what New Zealand are doing. Um, New Zealand just in the process of legislating to bring in exactly that system of fair pay agreements, which is a negotiated minimum set of standards across sectors in the economy. They've also identified care as a key sector for them, one that is undervalued everywhere and one that where they have basically said we need a different approach. And I think, um, as everybody has said, minimum wages are one, but not the only tool to help low paid workers. And I was kind of interested in um, David going back to the Fabians, obviously kind of the other Fabian sort of Fabian innovation was to talk about child benefit, basically, and to kind of get away from the idea of a family wage, which was very much based on a kind of male breadwinner model, which said you have one person earning and they meet the needs of the entire family to say, no, we need a decent wage floor, but we need additional supports with the 
with the costs of childcare, um, with additional costs that might be posed by disability as well. And I think it is really important that we don't see um, minimum wages as a solution to poverty. We see them as setting what we think it is an acceptable minimum to be paid, and that we recognise that we have a social security system which is there to provide extra costs and see these as complements, not alternatives, when we come to talking about the policy framework to help low paid workers. Um, again, this was my um, just borrowed slide from my last one, but I just thought I'd put it in to kind of make the point about collective bargaining. Um, I think one thing it's really important to recognise is just how far, a bit like with minimum wages, you know, there's been a big, big shift in the policy consensus, both in the UK, but internationally. I think we're starting to see that shift happen now in terms of the importance of collective bargaining. Um, I put up a quote from the um, OECD, who um, did a big study of this in 2019, and the OECD, not known for being a radical institution, basically said that collective bargaining at a sectoral level is the most flexible form of wage setting and one which best enables workers to respond to a changing firm form of work. Um, and then I've given you the kind of New Zealand um, example there. So basically, I think just in summary, um, we think, you know, the minimum wage has been one of the most successful policies in the UK in the last 20 years. Social partnership has been absolutely key to that. There is scope for significantly more ambition off the back of broad-based wage growth, and that broad-based wage growth is best achieved through stronger collective bargaining rights for trade unions. And I will stop there. That's great. Uh, thank you very much to to all three speakers, I think there there should be plenty uh, of of material. I uh, didn't want to rush anyone. Um, we still have, I think, a substantive amount of time to uh, discuss things. So probably take a number of questions and then do a round. Um, any comments? Um, okay, so we have uh, when and. Ying and then Joseph. Let's start with those three. Uh... Tim, Kate and David, thank you very much for this insightful findings. Uh, this is a question for Tim. Uh, I wonder things are happening probably uh, in our favour for this new pay improvement. One is the scale improvement. You know, the government put a lot of money for leveling up, like uh, uh, young people in the age from 19 to 22, you can sign up for any uh, boot camp, scale boot camp, uh, to, to, you know, to improve your skills. Uh, that would reduce their pressure on this lower pay because they are equipped with new skills. The other thing which I'm thinking is after we withdraw from uh, exit from the European Union. Uh, it's actually put a boundary for a lot of imports from overseas. Because I, I used to buy quite a few clothes from China because I'm petite, so I can't find the right size. And uh, now if I buy from things online from China, I have to pay quite a bit of tax. It's really stopped me from buying. So I thought that would, uh, these two factors actually do our favor to in, in, increase uh, this low pay. I wonder what's your thoughts on it? Okay, shall we take Ying and Joseph before we go around to, to responding? Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have um, two questions, one for Tim in particular and two for uh, and, and the second one for uh, David and Kate, if possible. So the first question is um, that is about uh, the methodology of um, sort of like uh, making and uh, making recommendations or uh, making minimum wage uh, uh, recommendations annually. So Tim mentions that you do visit. I mean, you, you used to do visits a lot to stakeholders to know about that, uh, to know about how they think about um, uh, min uh, raising minimum wage. I mean, adjusting minimum wage. So as a qualitative research researcher myself, I'm interested in how uh, the uh, findings or how the outcome of this kind of visits feed actually feed into uh, determining the recommended level 
level uh, of the minimum wage rather than just the need to um, uh, adjust the minimum wage. Like, for example, how workers, how, how workers or the stakeholders make sense of the make sense of the difference between 9.50 and per hour uh, and 8.91 per hour, for instance. So, yeah, I was just wondering how the physics help you with uh, sort of like setting the difference, setting the difference um, uh, 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 in uh, minute of minimum wage in different years. The second question is about a historical, uh, it is probably more historical. I was just wondering whether there was a point in time, a point in time in history where um, uh, uh, a monthly a monthly minimum wage rather than an hourly rate uh, uh, was under consideration. Like for example, we pay we pay rents every month, and then we pay we pay uh, uh, and then we get paid pro probably especially for salary workers we get paid for uh, monthly instead of hourly. So uh, so for me at least, or maybe also for other for, for uh, workers that I talk to in other national contexts, having and uh, knowing uh, the wage floor for, uh, on a monthly basis is probably more helpful than understanding how much I get per hour. Yeah, so we're just wondering in the UK context whether this has been in the consideration of like trade unions or campaigners or uh, policy makers at, at, at any point. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it was me next. Um, two, two, two questions for the whole panel. Um, the first is, I wonder how worried we should be about novel forms of contractual arrangement of work. And I'm thinking in particular about the very high profile debate about platform economy work and gig economy work and so on, where it's actually very, very hard to quantify what hourly work earnings are a lot of the time. Um, there's wildly varying difference, different estimates for how many people are engaged in this kind of work. And it seems like it's a few percent of the labour force in Britain. If you're talking about people predominantly doing this kind of work, but how significant has that been in the deliberations of the Low Pay Commission? That's that's the first question. Um, the second question that there's obviously a right wing critique of the national minimum wage. There's a long standing sort of left critique of it as well, which I wondered if the panel wanted to to comment on. It's very noticeable in my work as a as a union branch uh, chair at, at Leicester, that what's happening in practice is you're getting this gradual destruction of, of the very low grades because we have a nationally agreed grades. In the case of Leicester, we're a, a voluntary living wage organisation, so it's it's obviously at a slightly higher rate. But it seems that what you're getting is compression at the bottom of the wage scale and very, very little done for people slightly up higher up the wage scale. who have seen their wages fall in real terms by huge amounts over the last 10 years or so. And there's the old argument that if we want to address these wider questions, it rests not so much on these institutionalised arrangements, but on the agency, the collective agency of workers to engage in struggle, collective organisation at the point of production and so on. And so the question posed really is, is to what extent does institutionalising these arrangements over the over the national minimum, minimum wage blunt that impetus to engage in collective organisation and struggle? Is there a danger that paradoxically by giving this uplift to people at the bottom, we end up undermining these traditional forms of contestation over wages and conditions at work? Those are my two questions. That's great. Um, I don't know who, who wants to go first. There were a few for Tim, but I think that wasn't exclusive at all. Um, um, I'm happy to try and answer so, so, some of them. Um, so, so when you in terms of, um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's the sort of perceptions of labour shortages and a tight labour market. Um, I'm, I'm not. Uh, well, I think it's partly due to the pandemic, and I'm not quite sure how whether that's temporary or permanent. Um, you know, the uh, the level of employment is still 600,000 lower than what it was pre-pandemic, even though the RTI numbers are um, are similarly higher than pre 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 pandemic. Um, and we don't know how much of that is a switch from the self-employed to employees as a result of IR35s and other changes in the, in the, in the labour market. 
um, and whether sort of workers during the pandemic have looked to get employee jobs because it offers a bit more protection than self-employed jobs. Um, so we, we don't know how that's going to sort of pan out. And in terms of the withdrawal from the EU, um, it, it, its impacts on the, the labour supply don't seem to have been that great in that um, the net migration has actually increased over the last uh, six months um, as non-EU migrants have more than made up for the loss of EU migrants. Um, however, that, that might have um, different impacts on different um, sectors in that we know that agriculture is struggling with its seasonal workers scheme. Um, a lot of seasonal workers um, uh, post Brexit came from Ukraine. Um, however, I think most of the male uh, pre uh, agricultural workers who we had before are probably engaged in other activities at the moment and not not looking to come to to, to the UK and that's going to affect some um, sort of potential labor supply in in certain certain sectors um, we haven't seen yet um, sort of onshoring and greater increases in um, in, in sort of more, more things uh, made in in the UK however, um, everything is still sort of up in the air. It's still really, really short term for these effects. And if they, if they are going to happen, we'd expect them to happen over a much longer term than the last six months or so when everything's been distorted by the, the pandemic. Um, and yeah, we sort of welcome sort of any any improvement in skills um, of the the UK workforce and any help that that has on on pro progression. Um, which sort of comes back to some of the, the differentials um, sort of uh, impact. Um, so in terms of um, the, the last point that, that, that Joseph made about the collective agency and the left critique, all I can say is that um, prior to, to 1997, if you look at the period, uh, say 92 to 97, where we had an absence of uh, any wage councils or any basically uh, uh, intervention in the labour market, apart from the agricultural wage, wages boards, um, we saw that wage growth for the the bottom decile uh, increased roughly in line with CPI inflation, and that was far far lower than the median uh, the growth at the median, which in turn was far far lower than the growth towards the top. Um, so although that might be a sort of um, a specific a specific uh, period of history in the in the nineties, uh, it might also be what might happen in the absence of any bargaining power for the for the lowest paid? Um, and we sort of mentioned that about other form forms of, of work. Um, in terms of um, the sort of monthly versus hourly considerations, um, this was uh, those sort of issues were considered uh, back in 1997, 1998, uh, when the low pay commission was established. Um, because of the prevalence of part time work in the UK, it was decided that an hourly rate would be uh, better or easier to administrate than a monthly rate, whether you'd have to take into account all forms of different um, uh, different types of working. I should should note that um, the Dutch do have a monthly rate of the um, uh, of their minimum wage, uh, but the Dutch um, also have different hours requirements in different sectors. So the the equivalent hourly rate is 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 different in different sectors of 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 the uh, Dutch labour market, even though the monthly minimum wage is the same. Uh, so some some sectors are required to work 36 hours, some 38, some some 40, depending on uh, your sector you work in. So. Um, so I think the, the main reason why we haven't sort of moved to that that thinking was a that um, it, it would be difficult to uh, administer, but also b it the uh, concept of the minimum wage was sort of embedded in the labour market and in terms of hourly wages and labour costs and affordability to business, rather than the other way round of it being uh, an amount that um, is enough to, to live on or ha there's no needs um, element in our considerations of the minimum wage. I mean, we, we do take note of it in that 
we we are very concerned when we are making our recommendations that they should at least uh, match uh, re the, or at least maintain their real level, um, and that hasn't always be, been been possible. Um, uh, but it is a it is a cause of concern for for the commission when if we make recommendations that we don't think is going to maintain the real level of uh, so that would involve a, a cut. And in terms of the, the visits, um, the visits highlight lots of issues. I'm sure Kate can, um, and, and David can build on that. Highlights lots of issues that we might not have thought about uh, as well. And they also, um, all, all businesses always say that they, they're, they're struggling um, and um, that the minimum wage is having an impact. But um, when you go on lots and lots of visits, um, it, it's the, the loudness at which they shout uh, that you, that you assess on each, each visit. They're always going to say the minimum wage is having a detrimental impact on our business, partly because it's it's a constraint and any uh, constraint the business is uh, uh, usually against. Um, but um, it, it's the sort of the, the volume of those those complaints that we, we need to assess. And they don't come into our deliberations normally when we're setting the rate in a normal year when we're just sort of getting on the path and we think it's OK to uh, reach the path. But in our discussions of that, we first of all discuss, is it appropriate to stay on the path this year or are there considerations which mean that we should flag that the economic circumstances mean that we should come off it? And that's a sort of initial discussion which those stakeholder um, uh, views and evidence feed into. Once we decide that actually it's appropriate to stay on the path, then it's sort of formulaic driven, but it, uh, but even within that formula, there's still discussion on. Do we think that these forecasts uh, and uh, wage growth numbers are realistic? Are there reasons to think in the outturns might be a little lower or a little higher? Uh, and then we make judgments based on that as well. And that will be influenced by the stakeholder evidence uh, as well. So I hope I answered everyone's questions. Thank you. Do you want me to come? Yeah, please, please. Uh, so just a few things to add to what Tim said, just really briefly on the visits. The other thing that's really important about the visits is it means basically the worker side here, how the business side thinks and the business side here from workers, basically. Um, and I think that does make a real difference to our deliberations. Um, it's also quite a good way to make all the commissioners spend some time together, which is probably important for decision making too. Um, just on the monthly minimum wage, um, I've never heard it come up kind of from our side, but that doesn't mean that minimum hours aren't really, really important. So us all, for example, have a minimum hours. They think you should have a 16 hour minimum contract, minimum hours contract. We've done a lot of work about contracts which reflect your normal working hours, because obviously that's a huge part of your income two um just to pick up joseph's question um yes platformization a big issue um although increasingly you are seeing um both judgments that people are actually employed um i'm not sure that paying the minimum wage is the major driver of those decisions it i think it's sick pay holiday pay and tax on self-employment basically um the other thing you because you also sometimes see it in employ one thing that i'm often worried about is maybe it's a bit less as the minimum wage has gone up but you used to see employers employing people below the national insurance threshold basically um, to try and avoid making other forms of social contribution um, I think just in terms of like when is someone really working given that many of these platform companies are extremely data driven companies you'd have kind of thought they should have better records than anybody else and I'm just not really sympathetic to the arguments are you know is when you're waiting to do a job work absolutely it is and you know one of the drivers of insecure work has been you know the attempt to push kind of variable demand the risks of that onto workers and away from employers um, lots of our labor market <laughs> regulation is designed to make that fair sharing of that risk and i think we need to push back against it um, I'm likewise a bit impatient with the argument that the minimum wage undermines collective bargaining. Um, I think, you know, those arguments have been going on for a long time. I think at the TUC, we're really clear they're compliments. 
basically. Um, you know, if there are issues of differentials, they can be solved through collective bargaining and that's a good incentive. But I sometimes think there's a tiny hint of the, if only people were a bit more miserable, more of them would join trade unions. And I, I don't think anyone, you know, in the leadership of the trade union movement in our, or really even at officer level, thinks that's the best kind of recruiting model or the way we're actually going to drive our power. I think, you know, we do think we need a much more permissive framework for trade union access to workplace, for our powers to organise and bargain and to bargain at a sectoral level as well as a workplace level. But I think, as I said, that's complementary to the minimum wage, not an alternative to it. Just very quickly, Nick, on, on Joseph's final question. I mean, certainly if you have very strong collective bargaining, you probably won't need a minimum wage. Um, that's true in Denmark and Sweden, for example, but you have very, very high levels of union density and you have very, very extensive collective bargaining coverage. Um, and before the minimum wage was introduced, of course, the UK did have, as I described it, the fair wages resolutions, the international arbitration arrangements and wages councils. But we still had a really, really big problem with low pay, which the minimum wage has indeed ameliorated. Uh, Tim's right also to point out, of course, that it was only between 1993 and 1999 that there was no minimum wage protection at all. And that had a terrible impact on those people in the um, bottom uh, quartile. Just a quick word on the on the visits. Um, I think it's important for commissioners because it can reinforce things in your mind that are obvious in the data but are not particularly highlighted or emphasized um, and it can also bring you face to face with the realities of what it's like to run a business which you know sitting in a bureaucracy uh, which is what congress house is the tuc is is sometimes um, a little bit remote so i remember going to a, a pub just outside ashbourne in derbyshire on a visit to talk to the owner manager of the pub um, and uh, we had a very nice lunch there and she said to us well the minimum wage is not really a problem for me because if you put it up I just put the price of a pint up oh we said that's very interesting so we shouldn't be worried then so what is bugging you and bear in mind we just had lunch and she said food hygiene regulations <laughs> Taking the temperature of my fridges at every two hours or something, that's what worries me, not the minimum wage. So, so I suppose, just coming back to uh, Joseph's final question, uh, if you've got very strong collective bargaining, you don't need a minimum wage. But in, an, in the absence of Nordic style arrangements, you've got to have one, I think. And it's how you achieve that balance between the statutory intervention, the wage floor, something that goes above and beyond that for sectoral dialogue in those sectors where unions are very, very weak, and then allowing collective bargaining its full flourishing elsewhere. My concern with the TUC's current position, by the way, uh, with um, some sort of fair pay agreement arrangement, is that it's very, very hard to sustain that if you haven't got any members in that sector. And the real risk is that if it's instituted by statute, so the employers are brought to the table, compulsorily and then you get a change of government and the employers no longer have to come to the table you can see a catastrophic collapse not just of collective bargaining in that sector because the, the employers will just walk away um, but uh, an adverse impact on wages too and you can see that for example in Australia where uh, when the award system was modified and when enterprise bargaining was introduced those sectors where you had quasi compulsory collective bargaining wages fell and there was a catastrophic experience in New Zealand in the early 1990s under the Employment Contracts Act. Hitherto, union membership had been pretty much compulsory and collective bargaining was compulsory. Um, a national slash Tory government in uh, New Zealand uh, just smashed up that system completely and essentially said, you can appoint unions as your bargaining agent or you can negotiate directly individually with your employers. It led to a catastrophic collapse in collective bargaining because the unions had lost all organising capacity because they'd never had to develop it because everyone was a union member. Uh, and the same was true in Israel when the Histadrut also lost their compulsory union membership. So, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned if 
uh, trade unions in Britain make the centerpiece of their argument for building collective bargaining a kind of quasi compulsory system in the shadow of the law. I think that would be um, problematic in the future if you had a change of government and the Tories just said we're not wearing that because employers don't like it. Thank you, David. Um, Kate, Tim, do you want to come back on any of this? Because I think um, that's probably all we have time for, unfortunately. I think there would be much more, uh, really, uh, that you know, we, we could open up a tackle, but um, I thought I'd give you a, an opportunity probably to, if you want to say any uh, concluding uh, things about uh, for example, something that David uh, just opened up. Um, yeah, yeah, I always do that, you know, say something controversial. <laughs> no, that's good, that's good. Yeah. I, I just, just wanted to, to, to add to what David said, or to build on what he was saying, in that um, one of the drivers behind the Germans moving to uh, a national minimum wage was uh, a weakening in collective bargaining in, in Germany. And it may or may not be noticeable that the Swede, Swedes have got in touch with us this very week to discuss introducing a national minimum wage and how how we'll go about it. I mean, that might also be due to, the, I think there's an EU directive on uh, minimum wages as well. But, but um, so so that's sort of um, the, the suggestive that if, if collective bargaining isn't strong and it weakens, then, then there is scope then for a, a, a national minimum wage. I mean, maybe just to finish there, because I'm quite conscious of time. Um, there have been a lot of debate about there's an EU minimum wage directive which says that countries must have some form of minimum wage floor. It's been really, it's worth saying it's been really controversial in the trade union movement where with some unions where collective bargaining is strong, being very reluctant to see the state intervene. Um, and I think, you know, these are these are real dilemmas. I think it will be really interesting to see what happens with the New Zealand system. Um, you know, that's very much about what we're pushing for here and I guess I take David's point about you know nothing is you know trade unionism doesn't work if you don't have members that's a given in any in any form of in any form of bargaining um but none of our institutions are ever safe from political change just, and I so, think, so you could say the French don't suffer too badly from it we'd rather have the one step forward even if it was followed by one step back <laughs> Well, a, a French colleague once said to me, this is about 15 years ago, a French trade union colleague said to me, well, you know, you go on about your union membership density in the UK and your union membership problem. Look, we just solved this in France. We don't have a union members. We just have activists. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much, everyone. I think, um, yeah, uh, we probably uh, should think at one point for uh, uh, National Renewable Wage 2.0 uh, seminar or something like that. There's certainly some kind of follow-up. I'm sure there will be uh, opportunities. Um, but for now, um, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. So thank you very much for the, the speakers. Um, it's, I think, opened lots of stuff for us to go on with. Um, and uh, yeah, I as we say, uh, we we will upload it uh, on our YouTube channel, so that there should be um, sort of more occasion for for others who couldn't make it because of uh, commitments. <laughs>